moderator for this afternoon's session. I'm currently the Associate Director for the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program in the office, Department of Energy's Office of Science. The Office of, the, of Science has been building a broad basic research uh, portfolio in quantum information science since 2017. And this program includes my program's investments in quantum test beds and quantum applications in quantum computing. The Office of Science recently augmented our basic research program in QIS with the announcement of five national QIS research centers. So as you can see, there is an emerging quantum computing infrastructure with efforts from both industry, such as IBM Q, uh, Rigetti Computing, as well as the test beds at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratory. And today I want to thank uh, our panelists, which includes Susan Clark from Sandia National Laboratory, John Martinez from the University of California, Santa Barbara, Jeremy O'Brien for Sci from Sci Quantum, and Chad Rigetti of Rigetti Computing. And they will explore the future interest infrastructure needs and access models for uh, a quantum infrastructure. I want to do note that this panel will focus on computing infrastructure and not on computing networking efforts, which has its own session later. So to start, to start today's panel, I would like the panelists uh, to briefly tell us uh, about themselves and their relationship to quantum computing infrastructure. And Susan, could you lead us off, please? Uh, sure. Uh, as Barb mentioned, I'm Susan Clark. I'm at Sandia National Labs. I'm the principal investigator of the testbed uh, quantum Scientific Computing Open User Testbed, also known as QScout. And our, um, our goal is to understand quantum systems and uh, understand quantum information, which is probably everyone's goal on this panel. Uh, we're, we're building a small system based on trapped ions that uh, we will have, we have calls for proposals. We've just had our first call and uh, and then we're going to do experiments. So we're providing access to quantum hardware to the general quantum, you know, the general scientific community is, is really uh, what we're going for. Uh, so I, I've been building quantum systems for, um, for, for many years, probably not as many years as everyone else on the panel, but uh, uh, probably at least 15, 10 or 15 years. And, uh, and there's, there's still a long way to go, but uh, we're getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. John, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, um, I'm John Martinez, and uh, I've been involved in the superinducting qubits even, I think, before the word qubit was invented since the mid-1980s in my thesis experiment, and was worked at NIST, worked at UCSB, uh, moved to Google. Uh, we did the quantum supremacy, got that published, done, and published last year, and then I I uh, left Google in, in April. Uh, I'm back at the university. I'm also uh, doing other things. I'm actually in Australia right now, and I'm going to be doing uh, essentially a six-month sabbatical with Silicon Quantum Computing. Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us from Australia. Chad, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Chad Rigetti. I'm the founder and CEO of Rigetti Computing. Uh, we build full stack superconducting qubit uh, based quantum computers, including the chip design and fab and, and systems integration aspects of, of the technology. Uh, and we work with kind of government and private sector partners to integrate these systems and deploy them to end users. Uh, we are focused in the immediate term on building NISC-IRA machines for exploring hybrid algorithms uh, and also uh, using that as a stepping stone to the long-term objective of building large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computing systems. Um, I've been working in superconducting qubits since uh, around, I guess, the year 2001, um, and, and have focused on multi-qubit logic gates as my kind of primary technical area, and since 2013 have been, have been running Rigetti Computing. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Jeremy. Thanks, Bob. Uh, my name is Jeremy O'Brien. I'm uh, one of the four founders and the CEO of uh, SciQuantum. Um, I, uh, I first learned about quantum computing back in uh, 1995 and um, 
I really, I guess, understood back then that this was going to be a necessary tool for us humans to invent our future. And um, I've been working to bring quantum computing uh, into reality uh, ever since then. And I spent the first 20 years as a professor of physics and <clears throat> electrical engineering in the past five years as the CEO of PsyQuantum. Um, and I spent, uh, I, I guess, about a decade working in various matter-based approaches to quantum computing, including where John is right now. And I'm very jealous of him uh, being down there in, in Sydney where they haven't even heard that there's a global pandemic going on as far as uh, I understand from my friends and colleagues back there. Um, in uh, PsyQuantum, we're working on a, uh, we're working on a silicon photonic based approach to quantum computing. So uh, when we left um, uh, the university uh, to found this company, we, we took a pretty different path uh, to the rest of the quantum computing world. I would say we were very focused on uh, error corrected quantum computing. And uh, so far as uh, we understood, and I think this remains the case today, that error-corrected quantum computing requires a million qubits of order, and uh, building a system of, of order a million qubits requires being in a tier one uh, semiconductor uh, foundry. And um, we are in uh, a partnership with Global Foundries uh, manufacturing uh, critical uh, photonic components in their production uh, fab uh, here in the United States uh, to build that million qubit uh, quantum computer. And I think today the, uh, the, the, uh, the conversation is around the sort of prospects for us uh, seizing the opportunity that, um, that, that, that we have here in the US um, on, uh, on quantum computing. And I'm very much looking forward to it. So thank you, Barb. Thank you, Jeremy. Oh, okay, now we'll go to the second phase of our uh, session here today, and I will ask each of you a, a question before we get to the general question. And again, I'll start with you, uh, Susan. You did uh, note your role as PI of uh, DOE Public Use Quantum Testbed. Do private sector partners make use of the testbed? And if so, how has your interaction uh, with the private sector uh, been like? Uh, sure, yeah. So anyone can apply and actually IBM sent in a proposal and had a successful proposal. And so they're in our first round of users. Um, and actually I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with them because they've spent a lot of time uh, calibrating and testing their own you know, quantum system. And so they have a lot of the tests work out, worked out and, um, and, you know, and ways to say if it's good or not. And so I'm, I'm curious to see how our trapped ion system, you know, compares to their set of tests that they want to run on it. Uh, other things that we've interacted with, with companies on. Uh, so we, at the time, uh, when we were starting this program, we needed a quantum assembly language that we could use to uh, talk to our machine. And at the time, there wasn't a, an assembly language that we thought would, uh, that had every, all the features that we needed. And then we were also in a, in a weird place where we didn't want to um, show favoritism to one company or another, since we work in a national lab. So, uh, so we ended up writing our own. And uh, since then, we've uh, had a, some, uh, a few collaborations with a, with a couple of the companies to talk about you know, things that we did that they like and things that they did that we didn't do that we like. And so we've been trying to, um, yeah, you know, collaborate in that way so we can kind of both get better. Um, let's see. And uh, yeah, so I really, it's been really positive so far, I think, in, in terms of my interaction with uh, the private sector. Thanks. Great. I, I do know that Claire had let me know that, that uh, requests to use the test beds were oversubscribed by three times. Uh, oh, I think yeah. In the late <laughs> note that I got from him. <laughs> All right, moving on. Chad, uh, Regetti Computing uh, is a lead industrial partner uh, moving from the test beds to the new quantum funded, uh, new DOE funded quantum center, and this is one led by Fermi. Can you provide us with some insight into Regetti, commu Regetti Computing's role will be and what the value of the partnership uh, with the center brings to your company? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Thanks, Barb. So uh, as mentioned, we're the lead industrial partner on one of the five recently announced NQI centers. Uh, 
Uh, we're partnered with Fermilab as a lead organization on that. Uh, the overarching objective of the uh, Superacting Quantum Materials and Systems Center uh, is to deeply understand the mechanisms uh, in, that, that drive decoherence in super, superconducting microwave systems. Um, and to uh, lay a, a deep scientific foundation of that from the material science all the way through the engineering uh, application of that from process uh, technology applications and integration into our fab and foundry services. Um, <clears throat> And all the way through to concrete deliverables, such as integrating these improvements in, in coherence into both uh, uh, large scale uh, 2D integrated superacting qubit systems on, you know, on the scale of several hundreds of qubits, as well as uh, 3D cavity based superacting qubit systems. So as part of this, um, we see tremendous value in this in working with Fermilab and the uh, extensive number of, of absolutely, you know, really, really strong other partners in the, in, in the consortium. Um, and uh, first and foremost, quantum computing at today's scale is something where it's conceivable to approach this te technological and scientific challenge as a small company. Uh, at tomorrow's scale, it isn't. And one needs to either become a, a medium size or a larger company or form effective partnerships and alliances. And that's part of how we view this. So for the past seven years at Rigetti Computing, we've been doing a lot of uh, the, the, the kind of frontline R&D and development to get to this kind of mid uh, dozens to a few hundred scale qubits. And what we'd like to do is, is kind of form more deep partnerships with the Department of Energy and with Fermilab in this case specifically uh, to almost in invert that process, but we're acting as a commercialization partner versus the, the, the first mile R&D. And, and so through the program, we'll be partnering closely with them to uh, stand up uh, uh, quantum processor units uh, to integrate into HEP Cloud, which is operated by Fermilab for the global high energy physics community. Uh, we'll be providing foundry services uh, in devices to Fermilab and to the many other partners on the, on the center uh, that will support both the, those integrated QPU systems that we'll be building but more specifically and importantly, the iterative R&D that's going to happen on the device, the devices to better understand the physical mechanisms that drive decoherence. And then we'll also be working a little bit on applications of NISC era machines and hybrid algorithm opportunity we have um, to, to help augment that and to, and to get the global into the effort to develop hybrid algorithms for, for, for quantum for applications of physics. And, and then finally, there's a, there's a key role we'll be playing and benefiting from, frankly, on the cat, you know, catalyzing and developing the ecosystem from workforce to other industrial partners and alliances. Okay, uh, we might have lost that last sentence if you want to try it again, your bandwidth was low. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I think the, and then I was talking at the end about the ecosystem role that we'll be playing um, from helping to shape some workforce development initiatives to ensuring that commercialization opportunities are visible Thank you. and, and and catalyzing opportunities to further plant the seeds uh, of American leadership in quantum computing. Okay, thank you. John, uh, you mentioned uh, your work in uh, quantum, uh, quantum supremacy, and it's been characterized as a Sputnik moment for quantum computing. What challenges are you working on now after returning to uh, US, uh, UCSB and going to Australia? Uh, thank you. Um, before I answer that, let me just say something a little bit about the Google quantum computer. Um, I, I don't believe it's part of the network, but they are planning to open it up as a cloud yeah. service uh, and to be able for people to be able to do just this thing that you're talking about. And of course, uh, you know, when I was working at Google, characterizing the quantum computer was of utmost concern. And we, of course, worked very hard on it. And we have a variety of character characterization tools. And I would say, uh, I, you know, we have characterization tools similar to what other people are doing, but we would also like to point out that the quantum supremacy experiment is actually a huge characterization tool as to whether the quantum computer, when it's working with many, many qubits, is, are, if there are any additional error mechanisms and the like. 
And uh, we found that that was a very uh, important uh, milestone and benchmark to look at to see if physics and technical things are working properly. They're also, they've been developing some other benchmarks to look at lots of qubits. So I think they can add a lot to the network, uh, maybe in a more, more informal way, but I'm, I'm hoping people will, will look at that and, and pay attention to that. In terms of what I'm doing now, um, uh, I, I want to build a quantum computer. That has been my professional dream and kind of life's work. I was disappointed that that wasn't going to happen at Google because of the way they wanted to do things. So um, I'm on my own right now. And what's happened is since leaving Google, I've been thinking very deeply about what are some of the long-term roadmap blocks and frankly killers of both the superconducting technology and other technologies. And so far I've identified four major problems. Uh, uh, one of them uh, affect I think all uh, low temperature qubits and I've been kind of ticking them off one at a time, what are their solutions? So uh, I'll, I, I'm not ready to talk about it right now. I'm forming a company, but I'll be uh, discussing that. And it's just a way to help the community, I think in a way, since I've been doing this for so long. Uh, I'm also interested in helping other uh, qubits, uh, qubit technologies work. I've been thinking quite a long time about how to scale up systems and calibration and errors and all these kind of things. Uh, so uh, uh, I've been talking to various people and Silicon Quantum Computing uh, offered for me to come down to Australia to work with them. I, I got here about two weeks ago and I've been in quarantine. They've actually have been working very, very hard about uh, COVID, but I'm out of quarantine and you know free to move about. There's no active things here, it's quite nice. And went into the lab yesterday and we're, I'm starting to talk to them about some of their experimental issues and hope to help them and, and work with them to make a long-term plan, uh, plan for uh, silicon quantum, quantum, uh, qubits. Uh, you know, it's not quite ready at the stage other qubits are, but there are some advantages and, and uh, try to work that out and, and see how I can help them. So I'm looking forward to doing all that and help and continue to help the field. Uh, in, in whatever way I can. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, uh, why did you choose photons rather than other qubit systems uh, in Psyquanta? Yeah, so um, I, had, uh, I had spent uh, quite a bit of time working on various different uh, matter-based approaches to quantum computing, including um, uh, phosphorus uh, donor spin qubits in silicon, gallium arsenide quantum dots, NV centers in diamond. Um, and I touched a few different uh, other approaches as well. And, um, you know, back when I was in Sydney last century, um, we, we, had a, we had a pretty exciting plan to build this uh, phosphorus uh, donor spin qubit in silicon approach, actually uh, with quite a, quite a lot of funding from the US government. And uh, this, the story, uh, made a lot of sense, which is, you know, we were pursuing the standard dopant in the standard semiconductor. And the goal was clear, you need a million qubits um, because of the need for error correction. <clears throat> and I think the whole, uh, you know, the whole sort of um, uh, idea of, uh, of NISC and, uh, and quantum supremacy was one that had, uh, you know, we, we had been involved in, so one of my co-founders, Terry, he had some of the earliest ideas around uh, quantum supremacy for photonic uh, systems in boson sampling. Uh, one of my other co-founders, Pete Shadbolt and I uh, co-invented the variational quantum eigensolver with uh, our colleagues at Harvard. And, you know, we'd gotten pretty excited about that as, uh, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's a shortcut here uh, where we could do something useful with a small scale system. Um, but as we looked into the detail of that, we realized that you'd actually need a very good, uh, need a very large quantum computer for state preparation. And there were issues around uh, noise and error correction and so on. And so before we founded this company, uh, you know, the, the goal was, was very clear that we needed to be in this million qubit regime. And, and it had been, it had been my conviction uh, since those, since those days in the, in the late nineties that, if we were ever going to get there in my lifetime, we really needed to be uh, harnessing the tools of the semiconductor industry. So we needed to 
uh, you know, leverage the, uh, you know, half a century and trillion dollars that had gone into that industry because, you know, a million is a very large number. And of course, that's just the number of qubits. You're talking about a very large, complex system. And uh, in 2015, we came up with an architecture that had a, had a few key features um, that meant that it could indeed be uh, manufactured in a tier one semiconductor fab. And um, as of last year, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been manufacturing uh, chips in, in, in a tier one fab global foundries, uh, you know, in upstate New York. And uh, that's really, that's really um, that, that was really the sort of central thesis of, of the company from the, from the beginning was that we needed to be in such a tier one fab. And uh, we chose the photonic approach because that's the only one, uh, the only one that I that I know of uh, that will admit, you know, will admit manufacturing in such a tier one fab. That's the that's the simple answer. All right. Thank you. Now I I have a general question or a few general questions for all of you, um, and I'll throw it open and and, and let you uh, answer as well. Uh, the first question is. How um, could DOE improve partnerships and collaborations with the private sector? Uh, certainly, I, I am, am very interested in this uh, in my role as a new, and, and, and Susan might have some responses uh, from the lab point of view. But from the private sector, what could DOE do better than what it's doing now so that we could work with you? So, so um, I can. John. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I'll raise my hand a little bit quicker. <laughs> Price is right or something. Um, so uh, uh, what I would say is key here is um, to get the computers out there so that people can use them in these various uh, cloud services. And I think we're in an exciting time because everyone's doing that. And I think it's going to be important for people to see exactly how the quantum computers work you know, not some press release or this or that, but actually run complex algorithms, see how they work because, uh, you know, getting it calibrated, getting it working for practical algorithms is, is hard. And, uh, uh, you know, hats off to IBM for doing that for many years now. And I know at Google, there's been, uh, uh, people are trying to get the system so that it works exceedingly well for all the users. And, that's possible to do, just takes a while to get all the calibrations and software. And I think once people can freely use a bunch of different quantum computers uh, in, in w whatever form it is, I mean, it's gonna be a cloud base, so one should be able to use it even on an informal basis. Then we're gonna learn a lot, we're gonna know about benchmarking, and there are gonna be a variety of benchmarking tools, and we have to invent them and see see what's right. I mean, one of the tools that we thought about was, um, you know, running like quantum chemistry algorithms. And you take a prototypical molecule and you run the algorithm and, you know, you see what kind of kind of answers you get, as well as the standard ones of the qubits and even quantum supremacy, yeah. the essentially benchmarking. But it's good to be right. It would be good to be running actual algorithms. All right. Anybody? Jeremy, Chad? Yeah, I could I could offer a few perspectives. The first, kind of building on what John said, I agree that it's 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 existentially important to have users running real programs on quantum computers. Um, I think a, a a practical and tangible immediate term thing do we can do is is to continue to push forward with the Quest program. Um, the, the, this program to expand uh, user access to quantum computers is really important to the U.S. ecosystem. And and doing that through the through the labs and, and through the through the DOE, I believe is the best way. Um, with the with the leadership role that the DOE plays today in high performance computing, many of the users are already are already integrated into those into those platforms and user programs. So the Quest program, I think, is really important, and and and, and I hope that that gets fully supported through Congress. Um, I think John makes a essential and really important point around uh, deploying these machines uh, at Rigetti. We've been uh, operating machines deployed over the cloud more or less continuously since 2017. And it, it's hard to articulate just how much we have learned by doing that and how much we've learned from the endpoint users. 
both about what really matters to them when they're thinking about running practical problems on these machines um, and how, how well the machines truly perform in, in situ when, when you're really running complex circuits on them. Um, I think uh, about a year and a half ago, users at Oak Ridge uh, were able to use our systems to do what I believe is the first, what they characterize as the first, um, the first demonstration mm -hmm. of uh, chemical accuracy on a cloud deployed quantum computer. Uh, for computational chemistry problems. And that, that was a really important step forward. I think there's the long-term goal obviously is to build machines that are fully fault tolerant, that have the, the very large system sizes uh, that Jeremy alluded to. Um, and, and that is what's going to truly unlock sustainable, durable um, kind of quantum advantage applications for the whole industry and, and for, for the broader ecosystem. Uh, but there's a there's many 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 milestones that sit between us and be, between where we are now as an as, as an industry, and that, and uh, one of the most important is just can you compute things with your machines? Can they compute answers? And then you can start benchmarking that against classical computing and HPC, and then think about trying to exceed that. Uh, but taking that that approach of deploying machines early teaches you how to integrate. For example, how to integrate with existing HPC systems, whether it's the software tooling, the hardware, the networking, um, even just the access programs uh, as one example, and gives, gives folks a platform to begin to develop and accelerate the, the development of algorithms uh, for, the, for these machines. Furthermore, it makes the pursuit of error correction really an empirical field where you can have much broader community contributing to the development of improved error correcting codes and architectures uh, by providing access to these machines. So I think that's really important as well. Thank you. I have something uh, to add. Susan. Uh, sure. Yeah, so from the, from the lab's point of view, uh, the, the one thing that's, or one thing that's making it a little hard to interact with companies has been, uh, everyone is very concerned about uh, IP and, uh, and, you know, who owns what and, um, which is not, not a problem that we're running into when we work with the universities. So, um, for, for someone, I mean, so we have these user agreements that we're making uh, everyone we work with sign, but if, you know, say IBM has a problem with it, I'm worried it's going to take us a really long time to get that sorted out uh, with the lawyers. And for someone like me, mm -hmm. I, I know they're important to protect me and to protect them, but uh, it, it just kind of, it seems, it seems like a lot of work and a kind of a headache sometimes. So. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. Jeremy, were you going to say something? Yeah, well, I, I guess I'd just like to, uh, you know, commend the DOE for its uh, commitment to fostering and advancing uh, quantum information sciences over the years. Um, you know, I came from the, the world of academia and indeed spent, um, spent two periods at, at Los Alamos uh, labs. And so I know firsthand just how important the investment into uh, basic research at the labs is for, uh, you know, phosph fostering the advancement uh, of, of uh, emerging technologies. Um, and I, I feel like now uh, the industry is sort of at, a, at an in, inflection point where it's poised to graduate from, you know, from the promise to, uh, to the product, if you like. And I think uh, the government um, uh, and DOE in particular can, can really accelerate that, that evolution. Um, and already there's been uh, some significant investments uh, and commitments and announced by the U.S. government, and we should be you know, really publicly celebrating those uh, those things. I think, but even with these commitments, I think it's uh, also um, clear that China is out investing um, the U.S. by a by a substantial margin, and I think we need to focus uh, uh, increased uh, uh, U.S. investment on accelerating the path to building uh, those you know useful large scale error corrected quantum computers that will really be the you know, the transformative uh, technology. Um, and so I think, um, you know, these, these public private partnerships have the potential to, uh, you know, accelerate existing commercial efforts um, whilst also, you know, taking into account and, you know, incentivizing, you know, novel and, and, and tangible uh, quantum solutions. And I think, you know, overall, I would say that that quantum computing is really a moonshot for uh, you know for both our society and our economy, um, and every every business uh, that's meaningfully pushing forward the science is is really helping us to to make progress on that. 
we are, we're taking a very, very different approach, uh, as I alluded to uh, already. We're essentially skipping this, uh, this current sort of NISC focus goal in favor of uh, uh, going to the uh, large scale uh, error corrected um, uh, useful machine. And uh, we're doing that with a team of, of commercial, uh, you know, commercial and industrial expertise. And so I think engaging with the, with the labs particularly is, is really a, an exciting prospect um, uh, for us, um, as well as the, the wider industry. Um, and I think, yeah, the prospects for, for, for you know, building a scalable manufacturable uh, system in a, in a US uh, based uh, tier one fab is 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 really our is is our uh, near term uh, goal, and you know I'd I'd encourage um, uh, you know wider uh, participation of, of of the labs on that on that large scale uh, that large scale goal. Okay, now let me kind of turn this question around. Um, what roles uh, do you think DOE's test beds and centers and and even in our nano research, nanoscience research centers have to play in the quantum computing infrastructure. So. Yeah, I can, okay, I can start. start. Well, Chad, you go. <laughs> sure. John and Chad. Okay. Uh, okay, so John. I think it's it's very good that as a test bed, there's an independent, in in, in some sense, audit of the various quantum computers to really see what the performance is and uh, see what, especially see what the performance is in a practical sense as you're running things. And I think through that, there'll be a variety of, of methods and ideas coming out. And especially, I think uh, you have to look for a correlation of errors and kind of problems that don't fit in the standard model of, of, of building a quantum, of using a quantum computer. So uh, look at that, see how the systems work, really give feedback because everyone kind of always wants to know what the, what the performance is. And you know, my, for example, very recently there was a bunch of discussion about quantum volume and that's a very nice a metric, but not necessarily the end all of metrics. And I think by lots of people putting the, together these metrics, then we can kind of see what's going on. And again, looking for unexpected physics in these systems because things can go wrong and you want to engineer things things properly. And there's a very vital role as a as a independent observer and, and tester of these, these machines. Yeah, I think the, the user access programs are, are critical. Uh, I think th there's a couple of ways that they can support US leadership in quantum computing um, that I'll just add. One is that building large scale fault tolerant machines, there are significant classical computing requirements to support such a machine, um, whether it's for benchmarking or for carrying out, ca carrying out calculations required um, through applications of error correction cycles. There, there, there's substantial classical compute required in a large scale, large scale quantum computer. Well, I, I have something to add, Barb, if we want to. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. You can share from your perspective on the other end as one of the test beds. Uh, yeah, so what I think of what our test bed is offering that may not be out there is a lot of is transparency. Uh, when uh, we're allowing everyone to look under the hood and see what's uh, uh, and see exactly what pulses we're applying. And uh, if they want to write a gate that's a little unusual from what we, then our normal core set of gates, we can, uh, we can handle that. We can, you can, we can work with you about it. And then, you know, people can explore things like pulse shaping and amplitude modulation during a particular pulse. And, you know, and not just, you know, the standard, you know, here's an X pulse, here's a Y pulse or something like that. So uh, that, I think that's something that a lot of our users are really excited about, the chance to look at some of this pulse level control. And, um, and then we, we also, a lot, of, a lot of the times, I think in these other uh, test beds that people can access, uh, there's some, um, there, uh, some scheduling that goes on sort of behind the scenes, which, you know, which is good. It makes the system more efficient and works. But um, 
since our object of study is really the machine itself, uh, you know, having access and knowing what this exact scheduling is and comparing different types of scheduling, I think are, are good things that we offer that may not I, be I, elsewhere. I just want to echo, that's really great that you're offering that uniquely because when you're building a more complex system like what was going on with Google quantum supremacy, you have to make decisions on all your pulse controls. And uh, that I think if users can experiment with that, uh, that's going to help the field and help drive some inventiveness. So that's a great, you know, kind of niche thing to do. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's hard. Okay, you know, <laughs> giving people full control. Okay, uh, you know, but you, that that's a that's very good. You're doing that. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, you I can only. I can only really echo what my um, fellow panelists have have said. I think, as as John says, the you know the the need to uh, independently test and and verify systems, uh, you know, that really can't be um, you know uh, overstated how in, how important that is. And I think what Chad was uh, was uh, was saying um, about uh, you know interfacing with existing HPC capabilities within the labs is. Uh, you know, I think we, we, we understand that quantum computing will be used alongside a great deal of conventional uh, HPC in terms of the, the algorithms that we'll be running that, were, that have always been hybrid algorithms, you know, part of which will be run on a mm -hmm. quantum computer and part of which on a regular HPC. But then also uh, there'll be a lot of conventional uh, control electronics, very sophisticated computing controlling the, the quantum systems as well. And... I think as as we as we march through this uh, transition, the thing that I'm really excited about is that many of our labs uh, know a great deal about standing up, um, you know, large advanced computing systems, which is what we got to do. Um, so yeah, I think this is a great yeah a great direction we're in here. Well, I think that brings us to almost to the end of our session, and I want to give you all one last chance to share your parting comments with us. And so I think I'll start in reverse order this time. So Jeremy, do you wanna share uh, some parting comments with us today? Yeah, sure. I, I'm just excited to be here with, uh, with, with you and uh, my colleagues here. I think this just really speaks to the stage that, uh, that quantum computing is at. I, as I say, I really believe that we're, we're on the cusp of a transition from you know, the, the promise to the to the product, and I think um, I think the government can play a, a really important uh, role in that, and DOE in particular, in in accelerating that and uh, delivering it for all of the promise of quantum computing, which we haven't talked a, a lot about for uh, obvious reasons here. But I think the, the prospects for uh, uh, tackling very important problems that that humanity faces, uh, not least of which in in climate, energy, and and healthcare, are, are profound. And the sooner we get these. Uh, large scale error corrected systems up and running, the sooner we can start tackling these problems. Thank you. Chad, parting comments? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think uh, it is a very exciting time. Uh, I, I would also, I think there's also a need to view this as a long game and, and, and I think we need a national level commitment to being the global leader in quantum computing. Um, I, I believe that that's really important for the United States um, and, and, and that the NQI centers are a substantial and the National Quantum Initiative Act is a really important step forward. Um, going forward, the cost of developing the technology, the complexity, the scale that we're all talking about, th these are going to be incredibly complex of systems and there is a need for sustaining investments through the many milestones, scientific, engineering and otherwise, that sit between where we are today and all the promise and the progress that has been made um, since, since you know, John's PhD thesis and before, um, all the way through to where we are now, there, there's a very long path ahead of us. And the more we can approach sustaining investments to for in, in, in the public sector. Thank you. Uh, John. Uh, well, thank you. Um, of course, this is a very exciting times so that we can actually test quantum computers and I think it's great to open it up so that people can test them in a variety of ways. And in particular, as you want to scale up and build a, uh, let's say, error-corrected quantum computer or do a complicated algorithm, 
You need to know about correlated errors. You need to know about what things can go wrong. And it's only when a wide variety of people are looking at that you have a greater chance to catch things where they're going wrong and then, and then go about to fix it. And uh, you know we were very fortunate in the quantum supremacy experiment that it basically worked as planned. But I would, if you, we we thought really hard about that to make that happen, and and invented a lot of stuff to to get that to work. And I think uh, the DOE community helping with that, especially looking at correlated errors and running small scale error correction circuits, will be critical to understand what's going on because. You can use the error correction circuits itself to look for these kind of weird errors and and uh, and quantify them. And and with with doing all that, I I feel there's a, a really strong effort going forward to get these machines to work properly. Thank you, John. Susan, parting comments. Uh, well, I I just really want to thank the DOE for their investment. Uh, the DOE. Has a, has a long history of leading the world in high performance computing and you know they should lead in the quantum sector too and uh, I'm really I'm really looking forward to what I'm going to learn uh, or what we're all going to learn about quantum information in the next few years many years 50 years I don't know <laughs> thanks thank you and on behalf of DOE and the X lab conference series I, I want to thank you all for participating in today's session I was happy to hear that my high performance computing systems aren't going to completely go away in the next few years and that we have something to offer to the quantum community. Uh, and with that, again, I want to thank you all for your insightful comments and uh, look forward to continuing the conversations in any venue that we have. Thank you.